All right, good, mor or good morning to some of you who are on the West Coast, good afternoon um, to those on the East Coast. Um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar on home visiting for homeless families. We're so excited about this topic and our panel today. I'm gonna get us started. My name is Erin Patterson. I'm Director of Education Initiatives at Schoolhouse Connection. Um, just a few housekeeping basics to remind you about before we dig into our topic for today. Um, this webinar will last one hour today. Um, your audio as participants is muted, and so we ask that you use that Q&A box to submit your questions. Please share throughout the presentation, and we will have dedicated time at the end um, to share those back with our presenters for their comments. Um, today's session is being recorded. We will post it on our archived webinars page. Uh, it takes about 24 hours for that to happen. Um, and you will receive a follow-up email after today's session that will include the recording, PowerPoint, and any other resources. A little bit about Schoolhouse Connection, if you're not familiar. We are a national nonprofit advocacy organization, and our mission is overcoming homelessness through education. We are very intentional about that because we know that the more education a person is able to attain, the less likely they are to experience or continue experiencing homelessness. But we also know that schools, early childhood programs, and institutions of higher education are often the first and sometimes the only place where children, youth, and their families are seen and identified as experiencing homelessness and connected to critical supports outside of just educational attainment. You can check out our resources, schoolhouseconnection.org. You can sign up for our e-news. We um, send uh, e-news about once a week and try not to bombard your inboxes. Um, we work at multiple levels. We do a good deal of federal and state policy advocacy to remove barriers for children and youth experiencing homelessness. You'll find on our website lots of Q&A posted. We receive a lot of questions from liaisons and program providers. So changes are, if you have a question, um, it's been answered already. You can find it on our website. Um, and we always say the jewel in our crown is our network of young scholars who are um, completing their post-secondary education and who have themselves experienced homelessness. And we're honored to provide them with financial support as well as wraparound case management services. Today, I am joined by an amazing panel of presenters. Dr. Amy Dworsky and Dr. Amanda Griffin from Chapin Hall will share about their evaluative study of the Home Visiting for, for Homeless Families program. And we're joined by Sharonda Jennings, who is a program specialist with Start Early, who is implementing the Home Visiting for Homeless Families program. Just a quick overview of our topic for today. We always like to start by grounding ourselves in the definition of homelessness according to the McKinney-Vento Act, in case you are not familiar. Um, it defines homelessness as children and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Um, this includes those who are living in cars, staying in um, motels, staying in emergency or transitional shelters, which does include domestic violence shelters, and notably, it includes those who are sharing the housing of others, which we commonly refer to as doubled up. And in fact, we know that many families with young children are living in doubled up settings. Um, also wanna note that this definition has been adopted and implemented across many early childhood programs. So the McKinney-Vento definition does not just apply to K-12 schools. It also applies to Head Start and Early Head Start programs, to licensed childcare programs, and HUD homeless assistance programs also have a requirement to identify and refer children experiencing homelessness to early childhood programs. Just a point of emphasis about um, the impacts of homelessness, particularly doubled up on young children in particular. Um, we know anecdotally that Many families um, stay with others because there is no shelter availability in their communities, um, or they um, might find that it feels easier to stay in a vulnerable situation than try and go out on their own. Um, we've heard from many young mothers in particular who share that living in these doubled up situations puts stress on the development of their child, um, which our team at Chapin Hall and Start Early will go into a little bit later. But it's worth putting a point of emphasis on the traumatic impacts of this situation in particular. Just want to note that our definition of unaccompanied homeless youth includes older youth who might be forced out of their home due to pregnancy in particular. And so I want to point out the overlaps there, that if you work with older high school students, for example, who might become or have gotten someone pregnant, um, it's important to understand the impacts of homelessness on young children 
and the opportunities to refer and enroll them in early childhood settings. Homelessness has serious consequences, and you'll hear more about this as well from Chapin Hall and Start Early, um, but you can see here the developmental impacts, the long-term academic um, impacts, and the negative health outcomes that it does have on young children. Want to note the long-term consequences as well. Academically, we know that the high school graduation rate for students experiencing homelessness is the lowest of all student groups when broken out by race, ethnicity, income status, students um, with disabilities and English learners. It's our students experiencing homelessness who consistently graduate at the lowest rate. And there is um, a connectedness between homelessness and teens who become or who get someone pregnant High school students who experience homelessness are 10 times more likely to become pregnant or to get someone pregnant, and that's from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Homelessness also creates barriers to early learning um, for children and their families, and we'll go into this um, in just a couple slides a little bit more, um, and you can access these slides on our website, and I'll put them in the chat in just a moment. Erin, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't think anyone can see your slides. I'm seeing a oh. lot of emails and a lot of notes in the chat saying no one. I'm can so see sorry. Slides. Thank thank you for butting in and telling me. I'm I, hopefully I clicked a button to fix that. I apologize. Yeah. I will share I will share the link to these slides in just a moment when I hand it off to Amy here in a second. Thank you all for letting me know that, and thank you, Amy. Just a quick data note, um, Schoolhouse Connection did do um, an analysis at the end of last year where we analyzed data across 20 states, um, gathering information about infants and toddlers in particular who are experiencing homelessness and their enrollment rates in programs for which they are age eligible for. We found that across all 20 states, there are a little over 300,000 infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness. Only 7% are currently identified by and served by an early childhood program. And so this is significant because it means that about 93% of infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness across these 20 states are not being identified and are not being served by an early learning program, um, which as we noted is critical to their development. Just a further breakdown, and I won't belabor these slides. Again, I'll put these slides in the, in the chat and you can access this report um, on our website, but we do go into some state level data. We note um, the enrollment rate for the different programs that we analyzed, and you'll find data for childcare, early Head Start, and home visiting. Um, and we could only access parents as teachers data, but we're working on getting more program model information. And this is included in the slides and in our report on our website as well. We show um, per state the enrollment rate for our different programs, child care, early Head Start, and home visiting, which brings us to today's conversation. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Amy Dorsky at Chapin Hall, who will walk you through our um, topic for today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as Erin said, I'm Amy Dworski. I'm a senior research fellow at Chapin Hall. And for those, next slide, please, Erin. For those of you who are not familiar with Chapin Hall, we are a research and policy center affiliated with the University of Chicago. Um, next slide. I am joined today, as Erin mentioned, by my colleague, Dr. Amanda Griffin, who is a Chapin Hall researcher, and Shawanda Jennings, who's a program specialist at Start Early. And we'll be talking with you today about the Home Visiting for Homeless Families Project, um, which was designed by Start Early to help home visiting programs better deliver services to families experiencing homelessness. And I will also note that um, the project uses the very broad definition that Erin mentioned. So it includes not only families uh, living in shelters or in other places that are really not meant for habitation, but also um, living doubled up or couch surfing. Um, next slide. So just want to acknowledge, um, make a few acknowledgements before we get started. So first I want to thank Start Early for inviting us to evaluate their project. 
the Pritzker Children's Initiative, which funded the evaluation, and all of the parents and um, service providers who participated in our evaluation. Next slide. So as Erin mentioned, um, far too many families with young children are experiencing homelessness. And we know that homelessness during, during early childhood can have long lasting negative consequences for children's health and development. It can also heighten parental stress, which can lead to less responsive parenting and can interfere with the parent-child bonding. Next slide. So we also know that um, home visiting has a lot of potential uh, to address some of the um, negative consequences of homelessness during early childhood, but there are also uh, significant barriers for families uh, who are experiencing homelessness to engage in home visiting services. These include high rates of mobility. Um, there are often questions about whether families are eligible. Um, it's called home visiting and families don't have homes. They may wonder whether or not they're eligible for the program. Homeless families often lack the, the various documents that are required to enroll in home visiting programs. And families often have a distrust of service providers. Um, next slide. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Shawanda, who's going to talk about the Home Visiting for Homeless Families project. Thank you, Amy. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, so when we decided to launch this program at uh, Start Early, the goal was to really was to remove barriers to home visiting for families experiencing homelessness. Um, the idea was to make services um, more responsive to the needs of those families. We also wanted to, uh, we were hoping to inform change in policy and practice, increase integration and alignment across homeless service providers and home visiting programs. Next slide. So we have uh, our partners here that partner with us across this project. Um, the the programs you see in the dark blue are uh, programs that assign uh, all of their home visitors in their program. They have a caseload that have a few uh, families experiencing homelessness. Um, the light blue families uh, programs, new moms, they have specialized home visitors. So we hire a home visitor um, that their entire caseload is made up of only families experiencing homelessness. And then we have two other programs. They're kind of in the medium blue. Those are actually homeless service providers. So shelters that embed uh, home visitors, trained home visitors in their programs. So they're delivering home visiting services to the families that are living at their shelters. Next slide. And so as a part of the project, we have um, a participant agreement uh, between Start Early and all of the programs that participate. And this just allows uh, different modifications and flexibility around how to serve these families experiencing homelessness. The goal is for us to learn exactly what it takes, what's the, what are the right dosages and um, other ingredients that are needed to best serve these families and experiencing homelessness. So it might be things like um, serving families that move outside of the case, uh, the target area, reducing case loads, um, things like using alter alternative modes of communication. So checking in with families uh, via social media uh, or other um, vehicles of uh, communication when, when they don't have a home or they're so highly mobile. Um, and then just um, visiting at non-traditional locations. So some, some people may not have a home, they may not have privacy, they may be staying with someone else or, or um, couch surfing. And, and so just having the flexibility to be able to meet families where we can so we can have a safe private space to do home visits. Next slide. Oh, I think I'm gonna pick it up here and mm -hmm. talk about the evaluation. So the evaluation was a formative evaluation that had five different components to it. We did a review of the literature. We developed a logic model. 
We analyzed some administrative data that the home visiting programs were reporting to start early. And then we did interviews with home visitors, home visiting supervisors, and homeless service providers, as well as with mothers who are receiving home visiting services. And we're going to focus today on the last two um, um, uh, pieces of the evaluation, the interviews with uh, the service providers and with the mothers who receive services. Uh, next slide. So, um, we interviewed 17 home visitors and 12 supervisors from the 10 project partners, as well as a project consultant. We also interviewed 13 mothers and one pregnant woman whose families had received home visiting services from seven of the project partners. And now Amanda is gonna talk about the results from our evaluation. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the results from the participant interviews. First, I'm going to open up with some details about who we spoke with. Of the 14 participants we interviewed, the youngest was 18 years old and the oldest was 29, and the average age was 23 years old. Most identified as Black, with the majority of women being pregnant when they had enrolled in their home visiting program. Most had a high school diploma or a GED, and two were enrolled in school, and five were employed. The women had between zero to three children. Their children's ages ranged between zero to 24 months with the average age of 1.6 and with one parent currently pregnant. Um, next slide, please. Now a little bit about their living arrangements. Six of the mothers were living doubled up, primarily with family. Four were living independently but received rental assistance. Three were staying in an interim shelter and one was living in a transitional housing. The three mothers staying in interim shelters hoped that they would soon be living in subsidized housing and the four mothers who were living in subsidized housing hoped to be moving to a safer neighborhood in the future. Next slide. Most of the mothers we interviewed had a very positive experience with home visiting. This may not be surprising given our sample did not include families who chose not to enroll or who disengaged from services. Many had developed a close and trusting relationship with their home visitor. Because of the relationship they had developed, mothers felt comfortable talking with their home visitor about personal problems. Mothers repeatedly talked about the social and emotional support they received from their home visitors. They said that the support increased their self-confidence reassured them that they were doing a good job caring for their child and made it easier to ask for help. Mothers valued the information their home visitors provided on topics ranging from pregnancy to breastfeeding to child safety. Although they trusted their home visitors' advice, they appreciated that the home visitors provided information, but let them make their own decisions rather than telling them what to do or passing judgment. Next slide, please. Here are some quotes from the three participants, from three of the participants. For example, one mother explained, she always makes sure I know, like I'm not doing this alone. I'm doing a good job. Of all the services that they offer, the emotional support for me is the most important because sometimes I be needing it, especially as a single mom. And another mother said, I would describe it like a mother-daughter relationship. Similarly, someone said, everything that I need to know or that I didn't know, she helped me with. Next slide. Many mothers reported that their home visitor had shown them how to engage their child in activities that would promote their development using things like building blocks and puzzles that the home visitor provided. Several mothers also reported that they learned how to regulate their own emotions and how to respond to their children's behavior in more developmentally appropriate ways. Several mothers also also reported that their home visitors had tried to help them secure housing by sharing information about programs or assisting them with applications. However, a few mothers expressed disappointment that their home visitor could not help them more with their housing needs. And on the next slide, we have some quotes for you. Mothers described their home visitors as very responsive to their needs by saying, they did activities I never thought of and loved the, the child loved the, those activities. Also, they said, sometimes you got to like, why is this child acting this way? You got to figure out why. So I'm like, okay, you're right. Maybe this is the issue. This is how you should handle it. 
Mothers also reported receiving diapers, wipes, and clothing, as well as other essential items from their home visitors as being referred to as giveaways where they could get those items for free. Next slide. Now, um, I'm gonna share some results from our practitioner interviews. Um, we, just as a reminder, we interviewed with 18 home visitors and 12 supervisors. These participants represented eight visiting, home visiting programs and two home service providers. And one was a project, uh, sorry, two were homeless, two were homeless service providers and one was a project consultant. Next slide, please. So here we're gonna talk about um, the availability of the home visiting programs that were, that were facilitated. We found a great variation across partners to the extent which they took advantage of the increased flexibility offered by the program. For some programs, it seemed word of mouth or uh, it seems that the word of this additional flexibility had not always made it to the home visitors who were providing services. Most home visitors did not have their caseload reduced in a systematic way when they were serving families struggling with housing instability. And some home visiting agencies also reported challenges building referral pathways with homeless service providers. Supervisors reported quarterly at advisory meetings that they, that they were helpful, but I also found it challenging to fit them into their busy schedule and did not and not all home visitors were aware of the monthly consultations available through the project. Next slide. The next set of um, findings are organized around the challenges that, um, pro that providing home visiting services to homeless families might present, and we organize them across eight groups of challenges. Next slide. First, we're gonna talk about identification. So identifying families who were homeless was challenging both due to difficulties establishing referral pathways that I mentioned before, and due to challenges understanding the nature of families housing arrangements, arrangements and whether or not they met the project's definition of homelessness. In other words, in some cases, home visitors were too confused whether or not they should count families as they are already serving as homeless, especially when the families did not think of themselves as experiencing housing instability or homelessness. Next slide. Home visitors also reported challenges in engaging families experiencing homelessness due to competing priorities in their lives or concerns about being judged or reported to a child abuse or neglect hotline. Similarly, staying in touch was also challenging due to changing phone numbers or a lack of access to Wi-Fi where they could regularly get in touch with home visitors. Next slide. Finding a private space for visits was often impossible. For example, one service provider said, I know I've had home visitors who've ended up doing the visit in a bathroom because it's the only place that participants could go where a participant could go that they, she could feel like they had their own space. Some home visitors also reported holding visits in, a, in their car. Home visitors also identified um, privacy challenges when communicating with families staying in shelters, reporting that they often had to hold the visits in shared spaces rather than having a private space to meet. Next slide. Home visitors also reported serving families experiencing homelessness as requiring extra time and effort. This took, this took forms in multiple ways, such as longer visits when they met with families, needing additional visits, additional check-ins, as well as additional time to locate and reach the families due to that, again, challenges staying in touch. Next slide. Um, home visitors consistently reported that providing services to families experiencing homelessness exerted an emotional toll on them. Because home visitors developed supportive and trusting relationships with parents, parents often became heavily reliant on their home visitor. This is a great example in this quote. Homeless participants can call you or text you at three in the morning. Maybe they got pulled out of the place they are staying in, so they connect that trust with you to know that, that hey, I can trust my home visitor or my doula when it it's an emergency. So that trust becomes super heavy because now they're dependent on you. Next slide. Um, home visitors often felt unprepared to help the families address challenges associated with homelessness, which often resulted in feelings of, help, of helplessness. For example, in this quote, so when someone has to run into homelessness, I just kind of felt a little hopeless. I really didn't know how to help them. I really just 
didn't know what to do since I've been geared and trained to help them just with the child development. Not being able to meet all the needs of family, all the family's basic needs weighed on the home visitor as they reported doing the best to help the families access services and support their needs based on their training. Next slide. Although home visitors were expected to focus primarily on the parent-child relationship, they explained that much of their time was spent on helping families meet their basic needs for shelter, clothing, and food. Some home visitors felt that linking families to services and support to make, meet their basic needs took precedent over the, their home visiting curriculum. And in this quote, you can see, you try to talk about parenting. What are your questions about child development? It's a lot harder for us to kind of go into that conversation when they're trying to figure out where to lay their kid every night. Next slide. Crises often required imminent attention during home visits, which made it challenging to focus on parent education and their home visiting curriculum. For example, it's hard to focus on what you're there for when they're going through a crisis. You wanna help them as much as possible, but you have to be able to just provide them what you've got. Next slide. And the final set of findings from our interviews really focused around how the COVID-19 pandemic affected home visiting with homeless families. Both home visitors and parents agreed that the virtual visits were an effective way to promote and continue services during and throughout the services delivery throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And parents did not perceive that the virtual nature of the visits had a negative effect on their ability to, to, to gain knowledge from the home visit, visitors and their home visiting experience. Parents reported that their home visitors were able to provide them with, with the much needed support via both in-person and virtual visits. Next slide. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Amy. Maybe. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about the uh, implications and um, some recommendations from our evaluation. Um, next slide. So overall, our evaluation indicated that home visiting services can be delivered to families experiencing homelessness and that home visitors can play a vital role in helping these families by providing them with parenting and child development education, with baby supplies, with referrals to other services, and perhaps most importantly, with emotional support. However, as home visitors told us, they often lack the training and resources that they needed to address um, families' priority needs, especially their need for housing. Our findings also suggest that home visitors need both training and flexibility to respond to the needs of families experiencing homelessness, and that an adequate supply of safe and affordable housing is essential if families with young children are to fully benefit from home visiting services and other early childhood support. Uh, next slide. We have some recommendations um, based on our evaluation. Um, first, um, we recommended engaging additional homeless service providers in partnership to expand the reach of home visiting services with families experiencing homelessness. We also recommended promoting awareness among the various um, programs that were involved in the project about the flexibility that they are afforded um, we also suggested that home visitors um, systematically document how they are using that uh, flexibility to engage with families. We also recommend that uh, Start Early provide home visitors with additional training on the various resources available to support families experiencing homelessness, um, particularly uh, resources um, around housing. Um, and suggested that they implement a coordinated care model for homeless families in which homeless service providers and home visitors could work together to support families experiencing homelessness. And then finally, as Amanda noted, um, given the virtual, uh, virtual nature of the home visits, given that the virtual nature of home visits during the pandemic promoted engagement for families, we also recommend that um, programs consider making that a permanent option to engage with families even after the pandemic. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Shawanda, who's gonna provide some insights um, from Start Early. Thank you. Um, next slide. 
Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. So like Amy said, I'm gonna just uh, talk about some insights uh, from my experience working directly with the programs uh, serving families experiencing homelessness. Uh, most of uh, the findings that were shared today are consistent with the experiences that I have had working with families experiencing homelessness and working with all of the project partners. Um, as you heard earlier, staff often feel like they aren't doing enough uh, to help families in need of housing. Um, you know, they kind of have like a sense of hopelessness. And I think it's, it's I don't think it's a lack of anything that, that they're not equipped with. I think it's more so, um, like Amy said in the findings, we just need more adequate uh, affordable housing in the state of Illinois, period. Um, and so, it's totally understandable that they kind of feel like they don't, like they're hopeless. They don't have, um, you know, resources where they can just take someone to a shelter or, you know, take someone right to open housing. The homeless service provider system has moved to kind of a coordinated entry model where um, families have to all funnel through one point of entry and do an assessment and then be placed matched with uh, housing based upon their needs. So it's not, um, and often there's a wait list. So it's not as you know, easy to obtain housing as we would like it to be. Um, challenges to serving highly mobile families are real, but the staff are incredibly resilient and creative. Um, just from focus groups that I've held and just working with families and working with the, um, the project partners, they are incredibly resilient. They have found um, different ways and strategies to make sure that they make the most out of the time that they have with the families when they meet them um, so that they can continue to serve um, services, you know, with fidelity. Um, next slide. Um, participants, they are all really appreciative of the work that staff are doing uh, with them, particularly around the parent-child relationship and child development. I think that's one uh, thing that's really unique about home visiting as um, an intervention. It provides a space for families to really focus on the parent-child relationship and child development, even in the midst of um, a crisis, even in the midst of not having a place to stay or you know knowing where they're going to have their next meal um, home visiting um, allows for uh, home visitors to help build up protective factors in the in the moms so that they can um, get the resources that they need to attend to their crises while at the same time continuing to uh, build that parent-child relationship and learn more about child development. Lastly, um, we have learned that a, a comprehensive holistic approach to services is really needed to meet the complex needs of the families experiencing homelessness. So like, uh, like Amy said earlier, we want uh, more coordination between the homeless service provider system and home visiting programs, but we also wanna bring in infant mental uh, health specialists. We wanna bring in early intervention. We wanna bring in case managers, um, several different professionals from multi-disciplines so that these families can get the um, holistic and wraparound services that they need and home visitors can feel supported because they have a focus on their work, but there are other partners that are working with them to, um, to make sure that all of the other pieces are handled as well. Right, and I think, yep, back to Amy. Thanks, Juanda. And I think I'm gonna turn it back to Aaron um, to lead the Q&A. Wonderful. Um, I cannot thank you all enough, and I am going to try and um, start my video here again. I cannot thank you all enough for sharing 
Um, this presentation was chock full of information and insights. I'm going to encourage our participants to continue submitting questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to start with one for Amy and Amanda. Um, question about the evaluation. Um, this participant wrote, were there any objective or quantifiable measures in the evaluation? And over what course of time um, did this take place? In other words, how long had the parents or families been in home visiting and how long had the providers been working in home visiting in general and with these families specifically? Yeah, so there actually is a whole other component of this evaluation. There's um, a whole report we have that's available on Chapin Hall's website if, if people are interested in it that has all of the quantitative findings. Um, we could have done a whole separate webinar on those probably, which is why we decided to focus today on the qualitative findings. Um, but the, that report goes into a lot of the um, measures that the, the um, questioner asked about. So it talks about how long families received home visiting services, the age of the children, the age of the parents, um, number of visits, things like that. So if people are interested in those more quantitative measures, I would recommend that they um, go to Chapin Hall's website and access the, the report. That's great. Thank you so much. And I'll leave this slide up with the report um, link on it. Um, uh, see some questions coming in. And um, Shawanda, I want to go to you next, if I could. I know there are a number of um, home visiting providers on this call, others in the early childhood space. And so from your perspective, what's, what's some advice you would give programs who are considering moving towards this model or considering increasing their targeted services for families experiencing homelessness in particular? Um, thank you. Great question. You know, I think that what I've learned is um, home visitors serve, who are serving families, are, they're doing the same thing that they do with families experiencing homelessness. There's nothing fundamentally different about the way we uh, serve families. I think some of the flexibility uh, agreements and maybe considerations that we're exploring are, are the only lessons to be learned. Like, you know, what's the magic size to um, for a caseload? You know, typical caseloads could be anywhere from 15 to 20 families. But if you're serving families experiencing homelessness, um, does it need to look different? Should it be smaller because those families uh, have more complex needs and it might take more time to serve them? Um, other things like, um, model considerations. So like healthy families and parents as teachers, um, we're just trying to learn more so we could submit considerations to them so that we can continue to be responsive to the needs of families. So maybe when it comes to an outcome of uh, they need to have a certain amount of visits for each month, flexibility around that because we know that these families are highly mobile so some, sometimes a program might not be able to meet that benchmark or uh, flexibility around or grace around um, a deadline for an assessment. Things like that are things that um, we're hoping to learn more so that we can inform future program de development. But for programs now who are serving families experiencing homelessness, I feel like relationship building has been the key. The programs that we fund at Start Early are really big on building up that relationship first, and that really gets us in the door, and that keeps us uh, being able to go back um, and working with uh, the family. Um, so building that trust and relationship and also building the relationship with others in the family's network. So if they're staying with mom or grandma or boyfriend or whomever it is, building that relationship with those other people in the home as well. That helps to keep the home visitor and or doula connected to um, the family that they're serving, even if the family is highly mobile, uh, or especially if the family is highly mobile, having that relationship with the entire family helps to keep that connection. Amy and Amanda, I wanna open it up to you both as for an opportunity to weigh in on the same question from a researcher's perspective, from the perspective of conducting this evaluation, looking at providers who might be considering moving towards a home visiting for homeless families model or increasing their services. What might be some takeaways from your evaluative study that they should consider in starting? I'll I'll start. So I think one of the, the I think, findings that most stood out to me was sort of the 
the disconnect between the way families saw their home visitor and the way home visitors saw themselves. So families were so appreciative of all the assistance their home visitors provided and all the support that they got. You know, they, they, you know, both the, the sort of the things that the home visitor gave them, the support she provided, the emotional support, they, they were just really uh, effusive in their appreciation. On the other hand, the home visitors really, they, they felt so inadequate sometimes, right? They, they saw these families as experiencing all of these crises. They didn't know where they were going to sleep at night. They often didn't have enough food to feed their children. And they felt so inadequate to the task at hand. Um, and so there was just this real disconnect between how the home visitors felt that they were doing and, and how the family saw what they were doing. It was it just really stood out to me as, as one of the most um, important takeaways from the study. And, and hopefully that the home visitors, there's a way to show them that, that what they are doing is so appreciated by the families, even though they may not feel that they're doing much. That's great. Thank you. Amanda, any other insights to add? I think one of the disconnects I also saw was just the message that they're trained to deliver a certain curriculum or provide a certain set of supports for parenting and feeling an absence of the ability to, to really negotiate the housing needs. And depending on resources and time, I guess one of the things, the takeaways I have, especially listening to service providers in other areas, is that everyone can't do everything. There's a reason there are different jobs. There's a reason there's different people with different titles. And the solution might not be the home visitor developing a huge repertoire of housing navigation skills. The solution might be the organization bringing on a housing specialist who can support them. Um, so I, you know, every location is unique, but just remembering that Every, like the job of a home visitor isn't to fix everything, but it's to know and have the support needed to address parents' needs. So keeping in mind that, well, it might, the instinct might be, okay, now we need to train everyone on this skill. That might not be feasible. And if not, there's nothing wrong with having a specialist that na navigates those needs. Thank you so much for that. That connection or lack thereof to housing services is super important. I want to come back to that. Um, first, I want to address a question that just came in, and we'll start with you, Shawanda, for this one. The question is around the challenges related to identifying and recruiting families. Um, it says, could you say more about that? And how did you recruit doubled up families in particular? And for families um, for whom home visiting were already seeing, who didn't see themselves as housing unstable, how did the home visitors handle that? So Shawanda, we'll start with you. Yes, it's a very tricky question. Um, uh, so we do follow the um, McKinney-Vento definition, which is the, the more broad definition. And I think that allows us to uh, identify families uh, who might be experiencing homelessness. What I will say is some of those families probably did not self-identify as being homeless. And I think that's something that we uh, we work with as well. So they may come in and just say, oh, I'm living with um, a friend and, you know, you know, a couple months go by and they may have to live somewhere else and, or it's not permanent, you know, every night. And so they may not look at this as being homeless. They just look at it as, as a way of being like, this is, this is reality to them. And it's not necessarily homeless because typically when, when you say homeless, People think of the old, uh, you seeing people living under uh, Lower Wacker Drive or Tent City, or you just see people on the street in an alley and things like that. And they're usually adults. They're not thinking about um, the millions of families that are homeless. And, and most of the children in the family are under five and they are doubled up and they are living with, um, with friends and family or whomever they can live with. So I think identification identification is is a big training piece. You have to train the staff to be uh, knowledgeable of what uh, McKinney Vento considers homeless. And when you're asking questions about the living situation, not going in and saying, "Hey, are you homeless?" Just kind of asking, you know, um, what's your living situation, or who do you live with? 
And then I think a lot of it also comes with time, you know, after a, pro a family has been in the program for a little bit, that's when you start to see um, issues happening. Maybe they had a fight with a boyfriend and got kicked out or had a fight with mom and got kicked out and had to live somewhere else. And, and then that's when that cycle of um, homelessness and couch surfing Again, so it might not be at the point of intake all the time. Sometimes it happens after a family has been enrolled in the program. But I think just really training the staff to be able to identify for themselves through conversations with the family if they are a family that would meet the McKinney Vento definition of homelessness. Amy or Amanda, anything to add to that? I'll just say that was one of the issues that the home visitors reported struggling with, right? They would have a family and they weren't sure if that family should be enrolled in the project or not, because, you know, it's not a, it's not a clear line. It, it gets a little gray. That's really helpful. Thank you. Sorry, Amanda, go ahead. I was going to say, I know during the interviews, one of the things that was mentioned is through word of mouth. So people who were couch surfing or um, were being referred to were often based on people they knew who had a really good experience and were able to access a home visitor that was really helpful. That's great to hear. I know I want to note we have a number of our K-12 audience um, on this webinar as well, which is great to see. And they can also be a source of referral um, for our early childhood providers. And so I hope that they are gleaning some takeaways for this since they are well practiced in identifying those doubled up situations in particular. Um, I want to pose this question, um, and I'll offer it as a toss-up. Um, the question is, were you looking at different models of home visiting, and if so, were there some that stood out as more or less effective for homeless families? I think Shawanda should take that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I'll say is um, the uh, program partners that are participating in our projects uh, some were parents as teachers and some were uh, healthy families. So we did have a mix of, um, of uh, home visiting uh, funders or, you know, the, the models participating in the program. It wasn't, they didn't have to be one or the other. We just kind of asked for volunteers from all of the project partners that we fund and we fund um, programs that are delivering both healthy families and uh, parents as teachers, those that had um, a significant amount of families identified as homeless or they were seeing a trend in their community, we just kind of asked for volunteers. And so we have a, a mix. Um, I can't say that one model uh, is more effective as serving than, than the other. Like I said, I think that um, considerations with both models need to be made as far as flexibility around some of their outcomes and, and eligibility requirements. Um, but other than that, I can't say that one model would be better or the over another. I'll, I'll also add that there was another sort of model issue in that we had um, three different ways of delivering services, right? So we had some, most of the programs um, just uh, had homeless families on their typical caseload. So they might have, you know, serve, they might have a caseload of 15 and two of those families would be experiencing homelessness. We had two of the programs at, um, were serving exclusively, uh, we had, they had home visitors who were serving exclusively families experiencing homelessness and that's all that those home, um, those home visitors served. And then we had the two, um, homeless service providers that had embedded a home visitor in, in on their staff, essentially. Um, and so I think that each of those approaches has uh, different strengths and weaknesses, um, right? So I think the, the home visitors that had had a typical caseload and, and just were serving a couple of homeless families, um, for them, I think the challenge was that sometimes those families uh, had greater needs perhaps than maybe some of the other families on their caseload, um, which could which could pre present a problem. Um, the, the home visitors uh, serving exclusively homeless families, that may not be an option for some programs, um, depending on their funding. Um, and then the homeless service providers, that was something brand new that they, they just didn't have any experiences serving 
uh, providing home visiting services. So they had to, you know, get a lot of training and um, learn how to, to actually do that. So I think each of those models is, is worth considering. That's really helpful. Thank you. I want to, um, I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, I know that we, uh, this is a great question that just came in that I want to pose out here um, for Amy and Amanda in particular. Were there any dads in the evaluation? Uh, we did not have any dads in the evaluation. Um, I don't even know if there's any dads being served uh, by the project. Shawanda might know that. I don't remember seeing any in the administrative data. Um, there were there were very few dads, at least in uh, the, the data we looked at that were receiving home visiting services period. Um, and I don't think there were any enrolled in the project. Um, but Shawanda would know that better than I would. Yeah, so um, we didn't have any dads as the um, primary caregiver. I'm sure there were several dads that were involved mm, um, yeah. in the family, but not as the program's participant. That's helpful. Thank you for that. I wanted to circle back um, to the, the housing question. You both alluded in your portions of the presentation to the difficulty that um, families experiencing homelessness face with accessing um, housing services and that practitioners faced and experiencing that feeling of hopelessness and running into some walls. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more and walk us through, maybe Shawanda, we'll start with you in terms of what families experiencing homelessness are facing when they try and access housing services and why it's so difficult. And then would love for Amy and Amanda to elaborate on some of those findings. Okay, great. So I think um, the, the biggest difficulty is the lack of affordable housing out there. Um, but for a family who runs into a crisis and is finding themselves about to be on the street, uh, I think the difficulty is that they can no longer just call 311 or a shelter and say, hey, do you have a bed? I, I need it. Can I come and stay? That used to be the way a long time ago, but the homeless service provider system, uh, they've shifted to a coordinated entry process. So you have to go through one of their, um, um, I would say kind of their uh, hubs to um, to get an assessment first. You know, hi, what, what are your needs? What's your family composition? What's your income? Things like that. Um, and then they have a, like a priority list. And, um, and then they match you based on that priority list. But the other piece is uh, for that, most of the time you have to literally be already on the street to qualify for that, to come in the door. You can't say, oh, I'm about to be homeless in 30 days or something like that. Most of the time you have to be literally homeless. So I think that's the biggest um, challenge we're facing around the homeless service provider system. It's not, um, it's not immediate, like immediate care. <laughs> I'd say you won't get immediate care. I think also I, I would just add that the the application process, like for getting housing, assuming you're even eligible, that walk, getting through that application process can be very complicated. You have to provide lots and lots of documentation. Um, so I think that can also be a barrier. And if you're if you've been moving from one residence to another for you know several times, you may have lost your your vital documents, and you have to provide them for yourself and all your children. Um, so I think that can also be another barrier. Is just lots of hurdles to jump through. Amanda, anything to add? I mean. I don't want to state the obvious, but Shwanda said it very well during her part of the presentation, which is there's just not enough housing. So like, I just feel while while we're demonstrating like what they're experiencing while trying to access the housing, the reason they're experiencing um, the lack of support when you're not currently in crisis, but preventative support is because there is just genuinely a lack of housing and a lack of preventative programs that would really serve families that are experiencing um, being doubled up or, you know, transitioning between different housing situations. Point very well taken. Um, I want to pose one last question, um, and we'll start with Amy and Amanda and give Shawanda the last word on this one, and then I'll close us out. 
Um, my question is, what's one thing that you want our participants and the early childhood provider community to know about serving families experiencing homelessness? Um, boy, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I would say um, that these, the, these families are really like every other family that you serve. Um, they they need the same supports um, that you would provide any other parent or child, um, but they may have additional needs. Um, and just to be aware of that going into it and um, know that you yourself may not be equipped to address all of those needs, but there are other service providers out there probably in your community. Um, so just to learn what those providers are so that you can make appropriate referrals. Amanda, anything to add there? There are a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I know, I was like, just one? Um, I guess like I'd like them to walk away with something really positive, which is that the families who are accessing services are really are feeling supported. They're not feeling like there's they're missing out or they're not getting enough or there's a lack of whatever training that someone either in education systems or in home visiting services might need. Um, they really are feeling that they're getting a, a great experience. So just to remember that, I guess, when you know they're supporting families. That's great and super important. And Shawanda, last word, no pressure. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm glad I get the last word on this because I'm so <laughs> passionate about this piece. Um, I do feel like, like Amy said, they are just like any other family. They need these services. They want these services. Like Amanda said, they're so appreciative of these services. Um, really, it's about helping to improve the developmental trajectories of children and families. And although they're facing this immediate um, crisis need of housing, they still have a baby. You know what I'm saying? They still have children and babies can't wait. And I think that it's really important to um, make the connection or just know that, you know, in addition to helping them find housing or food or things like that, uh, building that parent-child relationship and learning about child development is just as important and it's going to help them in the future because they all want to be good parents. And sometimes uh, keeping the baby at the center and focus helps to focus the mom around getting things together in her life as well. Helping, it helps her to think, I, this is who I'm doing this for. So they're working harder at um, finishing school, getting a job, securing housing, um, so that they can be the best parent that they uh, wanna be. And so I just think that it's important for us to understand both pieces and know that they, um, they need it, they deserve it, they want it. And home visiting is a is an excellent um, intervention to give them exactly what they need. That's the perfect last word to end on. Before we say goodbye for the day, um, I want to remind you, you can connect with Schoolhouse Connection. Um, you'll get a copy of these slides along with the links, including to Chapin Hall's website and evaluation study, um, as well as start early resources. Um, we encourage you to sign up for our mailing list. You can use this QR code or go to schoolhouseconnection.org. Um, and as we sign off for today, I really want to thank Dr. Amy Dworsky, Dr. Amanda Griffin, and Shawanda Jennings for all of your insight and expertise. Um, please feel free to reach out to me or anyone at Schoolhouse um, with any questions or for further information. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful afternoon.